Hi, Kylie. Uh, we can't hear you again. Just bear with us, everyone. This is uh, Zahe, the joys of um, online delivery. We'll be Everybody, and good morning. Um, I have to say this is the first presentation I've been able to do um, it relaxed in my office. So this should be the most entertaining presentation you've ever seen me do, which is amazing. Normally I'm quite nervous before we start. Um, but today I'm presenting on digital health and I, I've specifically included health um, because I think mental health absolutely encompasses um, our health. But I'm here uh, as a clinical psychologist. I started my career as a drug and alcohol psychologist, helping people to overcome uh, the challenges that they have with drugs or alcohol. And I guess at that point in my career, some 20 years ago, I realized how important work was. So if I helped somebody to stop drinking, um, the best thing I could do for them at that moment in time would be for them to get a job. And it was that transition that became very apparent to me early on in my career that we needed to resolve. We needed a better connection between health and employability. And I guess I've set out the last 20 years of my career to ensure that we continue to drive that connection of what's happening in the health services, what is the science in health saying and how we connect that to employability. So I wanna thank the IEP for inviting me to present today and um, to provide you with that opportunity to connect what's happening in health and what's happening in employability so that we don't continue to operate as a silo. I know that the last uh, six months for many of us has been very difficult and I think it's become more and more apparent that we need to all work together. So what I'm presenting today and what I hope for you to take away today are some of the innovations that are coming out of health that we might be able to apply to employability. I'm also gonna leave you with a case study of where we have applied some of these innovations in health to the employment services market in Australia. So um, I know Australia is not as good as the UK, but what I want to do is show you how you might be able to create a synergy between the evidence and employability. Feel free to continue to chat as I'm talking. But before I get started, I think it would be remiss of me to not acknowledge um, all of the people out there who might be suffering with a mental health condition at the moment. We know before the pandemic that globally 450 million people were suffering from a mental health condition or have poor mental health. It was the leading cause before the pandemic of ill health and disability. No other disability overtook mental health. You've, if you've heard me talk before at IEP conferences, millions of dollars have been spent in the UK on trying to solve the mental health crisis. And I guess when we think about the context of where we're at, where we're at today, it really is more important than ever for us to think about people's mental health and how we're going to address this together. So firstly, an acknowledgement to all of you who might be suffering at the moment, but secondly, I want to make it very clear when it comes to mental health, it's absolutely something we have to work on every day. It's a bit like personal training. You'll see on the screen here, my eight year old daughter, Millie, this is her dressing up for a careers day at school. She, she told me she wanted to be a psychologist. So I told her not to do that, but, but, but she's dressed up here and, and her favorite saying, is you get what you get, mum, and you don't get upset. But when it comes to mental health, I want, it, want you all to be clear, that's absolutely not the case. With our mental health, we have to work on it every day. It's not something that you just get what you get and you don't get upset. Um, now for Millie, that, that's what she gets when my husband serves up dinner to her. That, that's a saying, I'm okay with her saying that when she gets dinner from my husband, but when we think about our mental health, I want you to take away 
if anything from my presentation today, we all absolutely need to work on it every day as if it was personal training, as if we were training for um, some kind of sit up competition. We all need to work on our mental health. And it's now more than ever that we need to do that. I started with this conversation today because the more healthier we are with our mental health, the more that we can have a bigger impact on job seekers and the clients that we work with. Um, so it's important for us to make sure we're well so that we can help as many people as possible. So there's Millie. I think she looks particularly cute with that lipstick on. Um, she'd probably die if she knew she was in my presentation being beamed across the whole world today. but. Um, I don't want you to forget that saying, um, with our mental health, you can absolutely do something about it. And I, I encourage you all to do that. So what can we do about mental health? Let's talk about that. But, but before I do, I wanna talk about um, who the Better Health Generation is. Um, you heard uh, Scott mention that uh, Natalie Keating is on the line today, our CEO in the UK, and Andy Meal, our National Partnership Manager. Uh, from the UK as well. But we are a team of allied health professionals and again, bridging the health and employability gaps. We have a team of occupational therapists, clinical psychologists, uh, physiotherapists, mental health nurses and generalist nurses. And we work together to make sure that people are able to achieve their fullest potential. So my PhD and why am I talking today? My PhD was in mental health and health and employment and work and how we might be able to help people to perform better and how quickly we might be able to do that. Because we know if you've got a mental health condition, you can work, but how quickly can we get somebody back to work and what are the strategies that you can use to help somebody to get back to work? Um, so I always come back to that study and I think about um, what does the evidence say how can we do this more efficiently? Uh, because it's not just about making sure that we are doing something safely, it's also about making sure we don't waste time. For some of our clients at the moment, um, we can't have them wasting time. They need to get back to work as quickly as possible when it's appropriate. So um, we need to understand as a sector, what strategies work and what are safe and how can we do this better, uh, particularly in a COVID world? So welcome to my team. Why am I talking about digital? I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist. Most health professionals are crap at technology and um, you could see how great I was with the mute button before. So um, I'm talking about technology because five years ago, I, I set about uh, buying a, a technology company and when I looked into the technology companies available and the evidence that was available for the solutions that they have, I couldn't find one that was quick enough, adaptable enough, was able to be co-designed with others um, and to be able to, I guess, as I said before, not be a silo, not just be a health app, but be a health and employability solution for us all. So where that's led me on my journey is, um, is that this year I've, judge two hackathons. I've become part of the alimony team for the University of Queensland, um, focusing mostly on digital. Um, so I guess my understanding of digital has absolutely grown out of my quest for making sure that we can connect digital health and employment together. Um, because we all know we walk around with our phones, you know, I've got mine here, I'm sure you've all got yours there as well. So um, how can we do this more efficiently? That was five years ago, that was before COVID. And, um, and I have to say the last five months have increased the need for us to be able to reach into the community more, give people more access to support services and allow them to access mental health support when they absolutely need it most. So that's why I'm here today talking about technology, even though I'm a, a clinical psychologist. I've spoken briefly about uh, uh, the different companies that we have here in Australia and in the UK, but essentially I think what you'll find is that we're all health professionals work, working in a range of sectors, whether that's be working with 
um, businesses to help them to help their staff to perform better or whether that be working in employability to help uh, employment consultants to perform better or, or job seekers to achieve what they want to achieve in life. Our, our business lines range from young children through to um, generation care which is looking after uh, older Australians. I'm pretty excited to, to talk about the, the last four brands here, which is the Next Generation PhD program. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you will have seen that I posted this morning uh, one of our first confirmation seminars for the PhD program. We have nine of our staff doing PhDs um, as part of our quest to be uh, the most innovative and, um, and also to be part of the next generation of health professionals. Uh, it's a pretty exciting um, time for somebody where we're publishing and researching job seeker stigma and the impact that that might have personally on job seekers. And particularly, I guess I'm interested in how that impacts on their mental health and um, keen to see how that plays out in the COVID environment at the moment. I've got a couple of other next generation programs which you can see there. I've just come today um, from a, a kind of a soft launch of our new brand, which is called the Wellbeing Code, uh, which is our mental health and health advocacy brand, which we've launched in Australia with, um, with an elite uh, sports athlete. Um, he's joined us this week as a way of going out into the community, talking about sport and talking about mental health and sport and encouraging the community to access our services. Um, so we're pretty excited to bring that program to, to the UK as well. I know we've got Andy, who's our, um, our famous football player, but um, we want to use sport as a way to open up conversations with people about mental health because currently the statistics tell us that 50% of people who have a mental health condition don't access care and don't access support when they need it. So if we can decrease that stigma in the community, I absolutely think it's our responsibility. So uh, I had the pleasure of, um, of shadowing Dave Shillington, our CEO in that brand over the last week. And I have to say, I felt a bit famous walking around with him, but um, I also felt quite short. And for those of you who know me, I am quite tall. So. Um, for another time, um, ask me a story after a glass of wine, but um, it's a pretty new and exciting brand that's coming. So why would I get involved in technology? And for those of you who don't uh, recognise this date, the 29th of June 2007 was a, a pivotal moment for me when it comes to technology. It was um, the moment that uh, we would walk into a room with a client and this would happen in the employment services sites as well and we'd say to a client how are you and they'd come back with the response oh, I've had a really bad week and my first reaction to that is always to say well what days were bad and what days were good tell me a little bit more about that and as we did that and as time from you know, the 29th of June 2007 went on, I started to realise that people knew what the question was going to be when they walked into my room. They knew it was going to be, how, hi, how are you? And how is your week? Um, and they started picking up their phones in the sessions and they'd pick it up and they'd start going, well, hang on, Kylie, on this day I was, um, I was bad, but on these other days I, I was okay. And I saw at that moment some 13 years ago how important technology could be in helping us to deal with and support people's mental health to improve. You have to know what your mental health is like right now to help you to improve. There has to be some kind of self-awareness uh, about how you're tracking and how you're going in order to help you to move forward. So that was a pretty pivotal um, moment for me. And, and for those of you who haven't seen a, an iPhone uh, one for a long time, you might remember the old charging cord. I mean, that's how far we've come today. Thank goodness Apple doesn't keep changing those charging cords. It's so frust was so frustrating. I remember they changed it every year. Um, 
But what's happening in health? Like broadly, what are the innovations that are going on in health at the moment? Um, it's not that easy to find what's going on in health and, and you don't find it when you, when you rock up to your doctors, you don't find it when you rock up to uh, the emergency department. In fact, you don't find it when you walk into a university. Um, there are some papers that publish uh, health innovations and it's hard to find which ones are just promoting their own products. But here I've given you a list of some reputable health innovations that are going on across the world. You know, we've got these mixed realities, which I've spoken about before, where you can see in the image below that you can put on these halo glasses and you can see these different images happening. Um, how fantastic for somebody with a phobia that we might be able to use this at some point in time when it becomes affordable. We've got these brain and, commun and commu <laughs> computer interfaces um, that are bringing hope to people who are paralysed. So um, you can see this gentleman here in the in the image. He, you know, he's able to move his arm, even though his his those messages between his brain and his arm have been paralysed. So it's a pretty amazing technology with these. Um, what digital is bringing to help people and to give them better functioning. Um, there's Crybergs that are going on where people, and, and you may have seen it recently, where um, an artificial eye is being created to help people to see again. Um, you know, maybe we'll end up like some of those um, X-Men that are on the movies. Um, maybe we'll all walk around with that at some point. There's 3D printing of drugs. I mean, 3D printing's been around for a while, but now we're printing it, um, printing our drugs in that so that it's more appetizing for kids and more palatable for kids. And on top of that, it's improving the way that we absorb that medication. There's telesurgeries. We've got surgeries happening in third world countries from um, more evolved countries. Um, absolutely the precision on this is what makes it so innovative that somebody could be sitting in London and, and doing surgery for somebody in Burma is absolutely amazing. We also have artificial food occurring. Um, obviously this is helping underprivileged uh, areas and families. We've got voice as a diagnostic tool now. We, we're now, we can now identify through voice different um, heart rates and different um, medical conditions as triggers, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got the patient, um, is also becoming part of the empowerment process in the in digital health. So we know that patients, when they own their health data, there's evidence that their health status improves quicker uh, when they can see it on their own phones or they can see it for their own eyes. Um, digital tattoos, how amazing could you imagine a digital tattoo that you could just wear for a couple of weeks and then mm. um, change it up because you're a bit bored with it. Um, I'm sure that's probably happened to people. Um, health sensors, there are a gazillion health sensors out there that measure a range of data points. So we know that the, the new Apple Watch can measure falls for people. You know, all of this health innovation data is particularly important when we think about mental health because we know that sleep is a big factor in our mental health. We know that heart rate is a big factor in our mental health. Um, and obviously, if you're having a fall and, 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 and maybe you're an older person, that's a significant risk factor for us. So these health innovations in some way, shape or form feed into mental health. And it's always interesting to think about what's coming next for us when it comes to mental health. So in relation to digital mental health, what it's giving us is a significant amount of objective data. You saw that image that I spoke about in the first, um, in the first few slides. You know, when you'd ask a client, how do you feel or how did you sleep last night? No longer are we just listening to their version of how they slept last night. We can absolutely go to the objective data and we can see what the objective data is telling us about their sleep patterns. 
it's not just about how many hours you slept in bed or how long you stayed in bed, it's about the quality of your sleep, how deeply you slept, how many REM movements you had in your sleep that could all affect how alert you feel the next day, how focused you feel the next day and, and how your well-being is the next day. So this objective data is giving a number of benefits for both the client um, and the case manager or the clinician on the other side who's reading this objective data. Um, on the client side, this, this e-data, which is kind of um, the acronym for it, we're seeing papers come out that it, people are, might use the E as electronic data, equipped, enabled. But my favourite one in the E is empowered. You absolutely feel empowered when you've got this objective data. Um, you're engaged and you become the expert in your own health if you own that objective data. And from a clinician's perspective, we know that when a client takes absolute responsibility of their health and their goals, they actively engage in shaping that for their future. Many of you in employability have seen this before. You've seen that when a client makes the decision that they wanna to go to work for that particular employer, our job is done because they're self-motivated. They're motivated by intrinsically to go and make that happen. And if we put our health hat on for a second, when they see that data, and they decide that that data is not right for them, they're motivated intrinsically to change it. So it's a really powerful tool to be able to see this objective data, and particularly when we start talking about that from a mental health perspective. So let me stop for one second. I said that objective data is really important when we talk about mental health. Let's do a bit of a check-in now. If you had to rate yourself on this emoji scale, how's your morning been? If you started on the left-hand side of this scale, you would see that the, um, the red, the angry, you know, no one was ready on time, technology wasn't working and so on and so on. And if you move to the right-hand side, you'll see that you've had a really great morning. So where on that scale would you match? Let's do a bit of a check-in. I'll give you one moment to think about it. And if you uh, want to post that in the, in the chat, feel free to do so. You'll probably also recognise that there's 10 emojis on your screen. So naught being the red, 10 being the green happy person at the other end. Let's do a bit of a check in. Oh, we've got some um, some really technologically savvy people putting um, little ticks on it. I love it. As you're doing that check-in, I might just um, get you to have a look at the screen and you can see uh, the Your Health Plus app here that's got the work check-in for the client and the wellbeing check-in. A few emojis, I'm glad that people understand how to track their overall well-being. So there are two real main e-mental health digital solutions. The first one, which we call e-mental health, occurs particularly on the internet. So we would go out, um, find a structured program, um, a bit like you might do with um, an e-learning platform. You might do some training at university on these similar platforms. So a lot of uh, research has gone into these platforms, but the question we need to answer today is, is it as good as face-to-face? -face? For many of us moving forward, we may need to start using these programs with our clients so we need to understand how effective they're going to be. Will it be as good as face-to-face? -face? At the moment, the evidence is saying this. It's effective at treating a range of mental health conditions or overcoming a range of mental health barriers to work. It's effective in organisational settings that the research is saying we can absolutely reduce in an organisation 
the symptoms of depression, anxiety and stress and burnout. Uh, we can overcome barriers with this technology in relation to our geography. We can overcome busy schedules so clients can do these types of structured activities um, anytime they like. And on top of that, anyone who might be avoiding addressing any of their mental health concerns, that can happen anywhere as well. So structured CBT treatment delivered face to face versus structured CBT internet based treatment with email correspondence. The evidence shows us that they're equal in power. Equally, you can get the same result. So if moving forward, we need to be based from home and work with our clients, if we've got a structured e-learning CBT program, we're keeping contact with clients, that is just as good as face-to-face. -face. It's also just as effective at reducing the mental health symptoms of clients. So both of the conditions achieved the same outcome. And that study was in 2008, so not, not oh, actually, probably quite a while ago when you think about it. Um, but the other really important findings here, actually, I will come back to you on that one because I think that might be a typo and it is 2018. Um, another really important finding, though, is that face-to-face -face, uh, facilitated meetings allowed for better monitoring of clients. So when you're providing the service over the internet, you can't really check in as much as you'd like to with a face-to-face -face service. The other thing that, would, that the research found was that clients themselves or our job seekers are more satisfied with interactions that are face-to-face. -face. I mean, you absolutely can't get rid of the human element of seeing someone's face. Um, compared to just an email and internet style service. And keep that in mind when you start thinking about telephone based services. Our clients want to see our faces. They, they get more out of that. Um, but when you compare them, they're both equally as credible. So we still achieved good satisfaction ratings out of both of those services. But what we know is that if you see someone's face, you're more satisfied. Um, the other really interesting point here is that internet programs took on average 35% less time than the face-to-face -face consults. So when we start thinking about um, people, a large proportion of people moving back into the workforce, we need to think about strategies that are faster and can access more people. So what about um, mobile mental health services? This is the second most popular. So these are the apps that people have. Um, but the mobile mental health services have a different element to them to internet. They provide you then with a chance to give check-ins, a chance to give um, data points. They also provide you with the opportunity to give some of those data points that we discussed before in the innovation. So any of that objective data comes through on these mobile mental health services. So we, we know they're effective, the research is saying they're effective, um, but they're effective in a range of socioeconomic groups. Um, they're effective with audio input and output. You can, when you're using audio, that's fantastic. You can text people, um, video calls effective. And there's also those additional sensors that we spoke about before. And again, it allows people to access more services and sometimes people who might not access them readily. There are more than 20,000 mobile health apps in the app store. Um, and if I got you to look at your phone now and see how many apps you've got on your phone uh, in relation to health, most of us would have one or two. Um, I'm not sure many of us though look at um, the health data that's on our phones as well. Sadly, um, in a research study conducted in 2019, only 73 of the uh, apps in the App Store had scientific uh, literature or scientific language um, that would be credible in a research environment. However, 64% of these 20,000 apps made claims that they had good evidence. 
but less than 50% showed you where that evidence was. So it's a great sales pitch to say you've got evidence, but only 50% showed you and proved that evidence. In fact, this research study said one third of them are absolutely unsafe. By the end of the study, only 2.7% of apps in the App Store at the moment or Google Play Store had any likelihood of having a significant impact on somebody's mental health. So what are they there for? What are they achieving? Why are people rating these things as five stars? I think for some people, it's a little bit of a distraction. I think the mindfulness apps are fantastic. But when we start thinking about the whole of person, and we th start thinking about addressing barriers to employment, we need to have multiple um, apps to do that because most of the apps that are in the app store are only doing one or two things from a mental health perspective. So we need something that encompasses a broad range of strategies and skills so that we can individualize it so that clients don't need to go into multiple apps to achieve their well-being they can just go into one solution that's customised for them. But again, it needs to have the evidence. Um, the American Psychological Association has created a solution for measuring quality. They put some standards together, which I think the world is looking at. I know Australia is certainly looking at. But there's three key principles of these standards. And the first one is that it needs to be evidence-based. So it needs to be written by health professionals. The second one is it needs to be customizable to each individual. And the third one is it needs to be co-designed. So we need to have clients and stakeholders. So, so in our situation, um, health, employability and job seekers, all making sure that they contribute um, to the design of this app and how it works because the user experience is, is just as important as the outcome that they're trying to achieve with their mental health. So what if there was a way that we could combine all of these things? We could combine the e-mental health solution um, on, on a computer through the internet, we can do all of those things that the literature is saying is working. It's just as effective as face-to-face. -face. Um, we can combine some face-to-face -face contact or at least some video call contact while, when we need it. Um, we could also combine the mobile version so that there were real-time data points and objective data points coming back from the phone or from the client's perspective. And that the last thing was that we had this opportunity to analyze the data and, and to be able to look at machine learning and how we might be able to create efficiencies with this data. Because multiple data points gives us opportunities to um, predict who's gonna be most likely to be successful. So here's a study that we did uh, a couple of months ago in Australia, um, so the Better Health Generation 2020. Here's what we did. We chose a high performing team who were ready for innovation. This was just in the midst of COVID starting. We looked at their service delivery model that they were providing for clients during COVID and we decided to integrate as much of that service delivery model as we could possibly into an app and into a web portal. We looked at all of those four areas that I mentioned before, and we put the service delivery model into the computer. We combined some face-to-face -face contact. We had the app that we provided with some tracking data so that we could see what was happening on a daily basis with the check-ins. And then we had the data analytics at the back end. The first stage though, what we hadn't anticipated was that um, the employment consultants or the work coaches wanted to masquerade as job seekers. So while we had these great tools for the job seekers, it was definitely a stage change approach. Employment consultants wouldn't recommend or prescribe anything to clients unless they'd done it themselves. And, and I get that. So that was our first stage. We had for at least two weeks, employment consultants doing all the activities that we would normally give to job seekers. 
We then came back together and we all sat down and we looked at the design of the solution and we looked at the content and we started co-designing. We started designing things that we wanted to add into the app and into the web portal so the clients could go away and do activities that were relevant to them. So one of the issues that was raised in the co-design process was um, that some clients were anxious about um, going into their workplace due to coronavirus and the vulnerabilities that they had due to their health condition. So we raised that and looked at solutions and looked at strategies and tools that job seekers might be able to use and provided that to them in the digital solution so they could take it in on their phones, they could be walking into the office with that solution and that tool with them so they'd be more likely to use it. But what did we measure here? We had to measure if it was gonna be successful because in order to be a high quality uh, mental, digital mental health solution, it had to have evidence. So we started with a baseline measure of all the job seekers in the trial of what their current wellbeing levels were. We also wanted to make sure that we measured the baseline level of confidence that employment consultants had before they started using the technology. We wanted them ideally to feel more confident at the end of using this technology. We didn't want the technology to distract them from their normal day-to-day -day job. And keep in mind, this was already a high performing team. So we wanted it to mirror what the evidence was saying previously that it's, it's as equally good as face-to-face, -face, but if not faster and more efficient. So we were trying to see if we could replicate that study. We also set about um, prescribing a group of um, four week activities and um, in between consult sessions, the clients and job seekers could go away and run these activities and um, test them out for themselves. Those activities were slightly different whether you're in employment and whether you are about to gain employment or hoping to gain employment. So you can see the list there. So the, the e-mental health solution, Your Health Plus, it looks at um, connecting the work coach and the job seeker on a more frequent basis in between sessions, again, to improve that engagement so that the work coach knew if I had a consult with them today and I was seeing them again in a fortnight, I knew the activities that they would be doing in between sessions to help them to move forward. Because remember what I said at the start, that mental health and well-being is like personal training. We absolutely have to do something about it every day. However, in this solution, we've provided job seekers with a range of well-being and mental health strategies. And on top of that, some employability strategies, because we want to be able to connect the two. The two industries can't continue to operate as a silo. We also had the additive effect of um, video conferencing in between with the health professionals if the clients did need it. And what told us if clients needed our support as a health professional was if their check-ins that you guys did previously was deteriorating. If they were deteriorating and going down to that red section we knew that that was a data point that would um, allow us to early intervene and call out to the job seekers to make sure that they were tracking okay. So we saw this as engagement. We saw this as providing ECs or work coaches more confidence. And we also saw this as an early intervention tool because we wanted to make sure that people had the opportunity to access good mental health support when they needed it. So I'm just checking in on the time. I'm thinking that we're running a little bit over. So I'll quickly flick through these slides. Uh, this is the, the Job Seeker app uh, or the M Mental Health Solution. And you can see there's a range of to-do activities that might have been prescribed by the work coach or the job seekers decided to do them. Uh, there's some goals that the job seeker has set, and that was either in collaboration with the work coach or on their own. 
And these goals, we particularly focused on whole of life goals as well as work goals, because we knew that there were some other areas of life that would motivate them towards work. And we wanted to make sure that we could create some data points or some object objective data that helped to prove that the, that the job seeker was moving towards their goals. There's some check-ins which you've already um, experienced and a library of articles, be it health articles, wellbeing, mental health tools and employability tools, some activities for them to demonstrate um, their expertise in those tools. Um, and that's always on their phones for them to use. Here's an example of the goals. I've already briefly spoken about that, that there's an opportunity for them to create goals across all areas of their lives. Here's a quick example of the library that was available uh, to job seekers on their phone or by the web and some of the tools that they might be using. And again, tools were really identified as something that job seekers could come back to at any point in time and keep using as many times as they like. And here's that daily rating. In this um, study, what we also included was the work self-efficacy scale. And the work self-efficacy scale is a validated measure that's helped to um, look at how quickly somebody might return to work. Um, so we used um, within the technology, within the app, um, this scale on a monthly basis to see if we can track um, improvements towards work. From the work, work coach's perspective in this study, the work coach was able to look at um, the to-do list, could add tasks in between sessions. So they might notice that the client wasn't able to finalise their goal setting. So they could add that task in at any point in between sessions. They could also check in on how their clients were going. So in this particular case, the client was rating their well-being on the emojis and their work confidence on the star ratings. So they could, we could see that they were feeling more confident about going to work and they were feeling more optimistic. And these are the activities that the, that the person was uh, exercising. This is an example one here. The data analytics were really important to us um, because what we wanted to track was that job seekers' um, well-being was improving. So um, as a work coach, you could sit down and look at the data that um, some that a job seeker, all your job seekers were uh, identifying each day and use those check-ins as a way to either push out more information to um, your clients or as a, a way to contact them early intervention, whether that be with the health professional or with the work coach. So let's get to the results. I mean, what, what did we find? What we found from this study, and, and this was during COVID, um, job seekers felt more empowered. So that little E that the research was telling us was working, um, they owned where they were at. You know, there's a saying that we use in Australia that you, you, you don't chop down a bonsai with a chainsaw. That's the same when it comes to mental health. If we're, if my uh, well-being is uh, a nine out of ten, what do I need to get to a ten? Well, it's a little bit different to my well-being being one out of ten and getting myself to a ten. So job seekers felt more empowered to manage their own well-being just by doing the daily well-being check-ins. We know that the wellbeing scores could also be really closely aligned to the activities that they were doing. So when somebody's wellbeing was reducing, they could um, be pushed out activities that were automated to help them to improve their wellbeing for the next day. Overall, the wellbeing across the group has improved by 17%. We're hoping that that wellbeing will also lead to more employment outcomes, which intuitively might be the case. But however, at this point, we haven't recorded that data. So that's to come. For those that were in work, we also noticed that there was more use of the technology outside of work hours. So that was a positive for us that they knew that they could access technology. And you'll see there on average, people were accessing the technology about 6.3 seconds, oh, sorry, 6.3 minutes a day. 
What did we find with the work coaches? Well, um, it's a change management process with the work coaches. We, we chose a group of people who were already high performers. So there was, a, there, there was some resistance from the work coaches, I have to be honest. It, it, it was hard to get them to see that technology might add something. And um, if the evidence is true, it, it wasn't adding something, it was saving them time. It's, it should save them 35% of their time. So it was, um, it was hard to get them to come on board to learn this new technology when um, it was only going to result in save time later on. So we, we needed to work really closely um, as the two organisations, the employability provider and TBHD, um, to make sure that we, um, we work together to facilitate that change. Overall, the confidence in um, prescribing the different activities and the different ways to overcome barriers um, improved over time. So it was good that employment consultants had the chance to do all the activities for themselves because it allowed them to then um, feel more confident about doing that. So what's next here? What's next when it comes to technology? Um, we are um, currently working on a corporate health solution um, and we're working with a large provider to deliver these services, um, the mental health, both M health and E health and the check-in and face-to-face -face data through Your Health Plus. We think that um, at the moment, the early signs are that it's improving the well-being of staff. And we know when staff's well-being is improving, performance is improving. We're also testing Your Health Plus um, with apprentices and hoping to um, show you the data that says that apprentices' stick rate in uh, their roles is improved because they're able to access this well-being um, data or well-being support over time. And we're testing already uh, Your Health Plus with um, employability providers in the UK because for some of us um, who are working from home, it is another solution that we can provide to our clients to help them to manage their mental health. And as I mentioned, uh, we're also um, about to publish our first paper around um, job seeker stigma. And I think that that's completely relevant to the technology because we know that more people are, act, are able to access technology um, and so they can avoid that stigma if they need to um, and, and the digital solution gives them that chance. So what are the conclusions? What are the takeaways? My first takeaway is Millie's point. You get what you get and you don't get upset. It's not true. We have to work on our mental health every day like it was personal training. We absolutely need a mixed model of digital interventions in our service delivery strategies moving forward. We can't just go to an e-learning platform. It, it's, it's effective, it's faster, um, but clients like face-to-face. -face. So if we're entering into any voluntary programs, clients wanna see our faces. So we need to add more to it. We need to consider how we might add um, e mental health and M mental health solutions into our overall service delivery model. If we do that, we can save time, we can increase the satisfaction of clients and we can respond faster and, and make clients feel more empowered. For those clients who are in work now, we absolutely need to celebrate that, particularly those who have disabilities or mental health uh, conditions. We need to support them now. Uh, so strategies need to be developed to enhance our service delivery model. And I, I might add that when we start teaching people better digital skills, the world of work in the future, uh, post COVID, is, is absolutely going to need digital skills. So as we start giving this to our clients and we, um, we engage our clients in using either M Health or eHealth solutions, they're learning something for their future and absolutely it's making them more employable because the world of work will need to be more digital. And lastly, I want to finish on, we're absolutely better together. Let's stop operating as silos. It's not just about health and it's not just about mental health and this app here and that app there. We absolutely need to all work together. And it's now more than ever that I think we need to do that. 
um, for the purposes of making sure that job seekers um, with a disability or a mental health condition aren't pushed to the back of the queue. When there are opportunities and employment opens up, I want to make sure that those people who have a mental health condition or a disability get the same fair go as everybody else who's just lost a job. Or otherwise we'll be sitting here talking about this two years from now, wondering how we're going to motivate people with disabilities and mental health conditions to enter the labour market. So it's absolutely important. So that's all from me, Scott. How do I go with time? Uh, we're a little bit over, but it's also fascinating. So we're now going to hot foot it over to the next session. Uh, thank you so much, Kylie and the Better Health Generation, all the way from the other side of the world. Thank you very much. It's evening there. Kylie's done us a massive favor by doing this so late on. So thank you very much. Fantastic uh, learning. Great opportunity. I've put a couple of links in the thing. Get in touch. If you've got any specific questions for Kylie, we'll make sure they get answered. I know Andy from the Better Health Generation has done that also. So please, please, please get involved. Let's get those questions back. And thank you so much again, Kylie. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.